No, no, sit. No, 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 stand. I was kidding, stand. No, no, sit. No, 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 stand. I was kidding, stand. Don't you love it when you don't know whether you're supposed to sit or stand? My favorite thing, I told you. I was just telling Pastor Christina, and she didn't tell me not to say anything, so now you're going to get my riff. I love when worship feels like life. Exactly. I love when sometimes in my life, I'm not always sure when I'm supposed to stand or sit, and everybody else around me seems to know, and I'm kind of looking like I'm doing my best to pretend like I, I know what's going on. And so sometimes... Sometimes we stand when we're supposed to sit. Sometimes we sit when we're supposed to stand. And sometimes we've got it figured out. And that's how life is. I am super grateful. I was thinking about this, that, you know, uh, Annette is so gifted and generous to lead music. Kathy singing, just so grateful. You know, we have so many different people that can use their gifts. When we hired Tanner to do what Tanner does for us, this was not what we imagined, but Tanner, so many gifts that he's able to use within the life of our church. And, and it really is an affirmation of, of how, as a church, we're trying to cultivate an environment where people can use their gifts in service. Uh, we understand that no one person can do it all. And so, super grateful that you all use your gifts for us. We're, we're just blessed uh, by that. You know, I, I uh, as we get into the word this morning, I, I think I've shared with many of you all, I have three boys, and so I'm always, I'm always drawn to those stories where it's about a dad and, and his sons. And I, I came upon this story, maybe you've heard it before, about a dad who was trying to teach his sons a lesson. And so he took them out and he had this uh, sort of, these group of sticks kind of wrapped together. And he he handed it to his oldest son and said, break this. And the oldest son, trying to break it, couldn't break it. And then the middle son, he handed it to, trying to break it, couldn't break it. The youngest son, how many youngests in your family are here? Any of us? So the, the, we knew we could do it, right? Because we're the youngest. We could, of course, even the youngest son couldn't break it. And then the dad kind of unwraps the sticks and starts breaking them one stick at a time and says, individual sticks are easy to break, but when sticks are bound together, they're stronger in a way than they could ever imagine. And, and I love that image because it kind of feeds into what we're going to be looking at this morning. We're, we're in this sermon series on the Psalms, and we're talking about this morning uh, community, but in particular what it means to be united as community, to find unity within our community. And we're in this summer of psalms where each week we're looking at a different psalm and, and noting that there are psalms of orientation that kind of speak about the foundational truths and affirm some of who God is. There are psalms of disorientation that, that capture the, the tension, the chaos, the uncertainty that so oftentimes life provides. There are psalms of reorientation. That, that speak about a, a hope and a promise of, of how things can be. And, and one of you asked me last week, well, what's, the pers- what's the point and the purpose of this series? Like, why are we looking at all these different types of psalms? And, and I was thinking, what a great question, because it, it gives me an opportunity to remind us that, that in the psalms, we really see what Scripture is always wanting to be in our lives. That, that oftentimes, Scripture is, is a gift to us because it confirms and affirms who we are, how we see the world, what our experience of life is, or our knowledge of God is. But there are also times where Scripture is intended to to really challenge us or, or convict us of some things that need to be different or capture some of the, the anxiety of, of what life can be for us. And there are times when Scripture is intended to, to provide us with a, a new vision, a new possibility of, of how hope can prevail over some of the, the challenges that we find ourselves experiencing. And so this morning, we're going to look at Psalm 133, recognizing that that it's a psalm that speaks of both the orienting truth of who God is and how God has made us and captures some of that future hope of, of what it means to be a part of God's people. And so 
listen to God's word as it comes to us in Psalm 133. Behold how very good and pleasant it is when people live together in unity. It's like the precious oil on the head running down upon the beard, on the beard of Aaron, running down over the collar of his robes. It's like the dew of Hermon, which falls on the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord ordained his blessing, life forevermore. You know, this is, this is a, a part of what are known as the, the Psalms of Ascent. Sometimes we hear that phrase, and sometimes it's a psalm of ascent or a song of ascent, kind of a synonymous way of talking about. These are psalms that what we know about them is there's about 15 of them, Psalm 120 to 134, that, that were psalms that would have been sung while people were making their way to Jerusalem. So what we know is that there were these pilgrimages that festivals that people would travel to Jerusalem for, God's people. And and of course, we might recall that one of the names for Jerusalem is a city on a hill. And so as they ascended that hill to get to Jerusalem for these festivals, the people that had come, the pilgrims that were making their way to Jerusalem would sing songs of worship. And, and these are those songs. This would have been one of the psalms that they would sing as they were making their way, as they were ascending up the hill to Jerusalem. So when we think about that and, and we think about just the, the sort of diversity of, of people that would be making their way to Jerusalem for these festivals, the, the sort of pilgrims and all of their distinctions, it, it brings a little bit more texture perhaps to this psalm as we imagine what it is that God is doing, what God is creating and wanting. Behold how very good and pleasant it is when people live together in unity. I mean, just imagine singing that as you're making your way up this hill to go to Jerusalem, going to that, that particular place for a very sacred purpose. And so within that, what we, what we know is that it begins with this Word that draws attention to the importance and the significance of what the psalmist wants us to, to hear and to see and to sing. Right? That somehow there is an importance of, of a harmony uh, amongst God's people. There's a, a good and pleasant reality when people live together in unity. And the psalmist then goes on to, to give two images of what that's like. And the first is in verse 2 where, where we read, It's like the precious oil on the head running down upon the beard, on the beard of Aaron, running down over the collar of his robes. It's like precious oil on the head. And, and we, we can imagine and we may even know that, that really this sort of almost reference to the hospitality, that act of hospitality of anointing that, that was so much a part of the culture at that time. We, we know that anointing with oil, oil was a part of that hospitality. We, we, a couple of weeks ago when we were looking at Psalm 23, within Psalm 23 there's that, there's that, line that says, you anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. There's, there's something about that that's, that's gracious and welcoming. But it's not just oil on the head. What we read in the psalm is that it's flowing down the beard of Aaron all over his robes. There's, there's an abundance, an overflowing graciousness and generosity of this oil. And as we look at this, we have to remind ourselves that while we may not understand the universe today in this three-tiered sort of paradigm, at this time they really had a three-tiered understanding of the universe, which is to say heaven and God were above, the earth was in the middle, and, and Hades and the devil and dark, the underworld was below. It was this sort of Neapolitan understanding of the universe. And and so for the psalmist to speak about things running down, there's a part of that that's imaging, like wanting us to get the image that it's coming from God, that this oil, this abundance, this overflowing blessing that creates this unity really is from God. That God is the, the source and the giver of that. And, and this running down is a phrase that's used a number of times, which is to say that, that God's blessing flows from heaven. 
that living together in unity, this behold how pleasant and how good it is, really comes from God. It's a gift to be received from God. And so, so our fellowship of community, this Christian community that we have created is like oil poured on the head, running down on the beard, overflowing and abundant, a gift from God. And there's an extravagance in that gift. There's a beauty in that gift. And the way in which that gift is administered is by the beard of the person, Aaron, some of us may remember the name of Aaron being Moses' brother, and he is this high priest that sort of speaks about how God speaks through the priestly role and tradition into the community. There's this image that people would have immediately sort of resonated with. And then the psalmist provides a different image. So there's this abundance of, of graciousness from God, but then there's also, in verse 3, what we read is it's, like dew of Hermon, which falls on the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord ordained his blessing life forevermore. You know, if I'm going to be honest, I will say that for many decades of my Christian life, I thought the dew of Hermon was about a person. I didn't understand it at all until I realized that it's Mount Hermon. Now, some of you probably have always known that. I did not always know that. But Mount Hermon is in the northern part of of this region and was a high peak that would have had dew and rain and moisture. And Mount Zion is in the southern part and was dry and arid and lower. And so in some ways, what the psalmist is doing is saying, how amazing would it be if the dew from Hermon was able to fall on Mount Zion? That the renewal of this dry and arid place came from somewhere else. That's how amazing it is when people live together in unity. That's how good and pleasant it is. And it's this, it's this really powerful image that then speaks about God's blessing, life forevermore. Because the psalmist anticipates the solidarity and harmony of all humanity as it lives without defensiveness in a creation benevolent enough to care for itself, for all I was thinking about that sort of harmony as some of you are a part of the Interfaith Interconnect. Our church has been a part for decades, not just of the Interfaith Backpack Project, but also Interfaith Interconnect, which really tries to foster dialogue and conversation about amongst people of different perspectives and faith traditions. And this Wednesday at 7 o'clock, Interfaith Interconnect is going to have its first in-person gathering in years at St. Charles Catholic Church in the southern part of Livermore. It's, it's going to be a great time together. And, and within that, I was connecting with Rabbi Larry and Father Kwame about the blessing of the grapes. We were talking about this Interfaith Interconnect. We're talking about the blessing of the grapes. It's one of the real hardships of my job to at times bless the harvest here in the Livermore Valley. Pastor Josh is going to be doing that this year. But as Father Kwame and Rabbi Larry and I were talking, we regularly talk about how, how awesome it is that when you go to the blessing of the grapes, we all three show up, but inevitably it's a priest, a rabbi, and a minister showing up. <laughs> exactly. It's made for a joke. And so we, we always laugh about that because we love the friendship, we love the connection that we have, but we also sometimes chuckle about how we see some things differently. Like we see Jesus a little differently. We see the Pope pretty differently. And we don't try to pretend like we're all the same, but we really, we honor and we, we sort of delight in, in the perspectives that we all bring to, to this life of faith that we're living. And Psalm 133, I think, grounds us in the reality that that illustrates. It grounds us in the reality that we're called to unity, not uniformity. And I know that can feel like a little bit of a semantical difference, but, but uniformity is all about sameness. For things, that, it's to be the same. Uniforms are about making everyone the same, right? Having the same form, the same manner or degree. There's, there's no variables, right? There's no, uh, there's no distinctions within uniformity. But unity is something quite different. Unity is actually a condition of harmony, 
It's a, it's a way in which it's the totality of related parts being held together in some harmonious manner. And, and the psalmist speaks of unity, right? A, a unity that's held together harmoniously in the truth and the reality of God's love. And to be clear, with unity, there is distinctive, distinctiveness. There are differences. There are uniquenesses. There are perspectives and convictions and experiences that are quite different. In unity, we, we really acknowledge those distinctions. We don't pretend that they don't exist. Unity demands that we don't just acknowledge them, but actually engage in and respect and honor those differences. And for followers of Jesus, what we know is that faith is not simply an individual or intellectual exercise. Faith invites us, maybe even expects us, to live in a community where we, where we honor, understand, allow to exist together some of those distinctions that people bring, that we bring, which is where it can get a little bit tricky, right? Right? Because as soon as we talk about honoring distinctions and differences, we all probably realize that we're talking about something very different than this world that we're living in right now. A world that, that so quickly and easily gravitates towards trying to create uniformity, demanding that everyone be the same, demanding that everyone say the same thing or vote the same way or see issues from the same perspective. And yet that's not at all what Scripture ever calls us to create. The beauty of, of what it means to be God's people is found in the unity that acknowledges the distinctiveness of each one of us, the community's parts. It really is one of the values of our church. It's not always easy. It'd probably be a lot easier to try to make a church uniform as opposed to united. But but we really are trying to find ways to honor the faithfulness of different perspectives, to, to allow for the distinctiveness of the gifts that we bring as we try to faithfully be about the ministry that God has entrusted to us, to, to create a space for different perspectives and different experiences and expressions of faith. Psalm 133 orients us to to the truth of God, which is the blessedness of unity. Siblings being connected to and woven into this larger community. And when that happens, what Psalm 133 says is it's pleasant and it's good. Now, I was thinking about an image for community, and, and you're going to have to stick with me on this one because a friend of mine has opened a brewery in the South called the Flying V. Now, I did not exactly know where the name the Flying V would come from. Some of you all may know what the Flying V is, that Flying V when birds fly in the formation of a V. You familiar with this? Right? Well, evidently, I asked him, well, how is that the name you chose? And he said, oh my gosh, it's so hilarious. The science behind the Flying V is amazing. And I went, what? Okay, I'll ask, what's the science behind the Flying V? And he went on to explain to me how in the Flying V formation, that each bird flaps its wings, it creates this uplift, and that ultimately the birds behind it in formation are able to sort of benefit from that uplift. And by flying in the flying V formation, they increase their range of flight, the distance they can go collectively by 70%. It's pretty impressive. A lot of you are nodding like you're like, I already knew that. Theo's over there going, uh, Steve, I learned that in fourth grade. <laughs> Easy, Theo. We'll be okay. But in addition to that... There's all of the ways in which the, the, the birds behave with one another within that formation. That at some point, the lead bird gets tired and falls to the back and others step up. And there's this, there's this synchronicity of working together within that flying V. And so I was thinking about how that is such a great image for what it means to be united in this thing we call church. That that there is something powerful about people who share a common direction and a sense of community coming together in a way that allows us to, to get, move forward in ways that are more, more impactful, more in sync, so that we might experience and express God's love in more tangible ways. 
That's really what we want to be as a community. United in that hope that doesn't eliminate the distinctiveness of each one of us, but holds that distinctiveness within the harmony of God's love for each one of us. And that's ultimately why we celebrate communion. We don't do it because it's this ritual that, that has been done for, for hundreds of years. We don't do it because we're trying to check a box or, or satisfy a book of worship. We do it because it's supposed to symbolically and in reality remind us of something that's true about who God is and how God has made us. Because if we all had to be the same in order to share this meal, guess what we would never share? This meal. But if in humility we recognize that this meal isn't about us, and who's invited to this meal isn't dependent upon my preferences. But instead, this meal speaks to the unity of God's love that holds us in all of our distinctions, in all of our uniqueness, in all of our differences. I love knowing that you're worshiping, I'm worshiping with someone right now, either in person or online, that is fundamentally opposed to the thing you're most in favor of. You absolutely are. We are not a uniform community of faith. We are not a one-issue church. We are a church that is trying to, in humility, just pray that God's love would hold us, all of us, in a way that would enable us to better discover what it means to be created in God's image and what it means to live out that image, live out that love through the actions and the substance of our lives. And Jesus invites us to share this meal, to, to delight in the blessing and the joy of unity. Let's pray. We're so grateful, God, for a chance to come together, for a chance to to delight in the differences, the distinctions of who we are, to delight in who we're becoming. We just pray, God, that, that you would allow your spirit to, to hold us and to guide us as we seek to gather around your table, that, that this meal would become for us a meal that, that strengthens us and encourages us as we, as we live our lives with you and for you. So we ask that that spirit would, would unite us as we share this meal together in Jesus' name. Amen.